Fire away. All right. <laughs> Can I start? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Viviana. Before you uh, you arrive to the scene, I mentioned that this is the talk I will uh, present to my kids because I think they can actually understand most of it. And that's really good. <laughs> um, I have some questions and I think actually there might be corrections. And then I have a question that might be mind boggling in the end. Um, so first you say that there is only one possible solution where you have a stable uh, electric field or rather a stable uh, confinement where you have uh, uh, not cancellation of fields and that is h bar you know, divided by two a half you have to make two rotations yes yes uh, but there are actually some higher order rotations you could have not complete not complete cancellations you can take uh, three h bar over two uh, that is five turns or seven turns you know, you, you can have all the odd, or or maybe no, it's two, four, eight. <laughs> it's all the even number of turns. Then you get some remaining uh, electric field. But all those are so much uh, higher order, so they are, are probably not stable. But I'm thinking maybe we can observe them in a high energy experiment. And then I guess those would be kind of uh, the spherical Bessel functions instead of a as polar, <coughs> completely as polar I'm, electric field. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, well, there's a little sign out there that says uh, emissions are due to brevity and mistakes are unintentional. Now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I as far as higher order um, rotations are concerned, I was talking about stable particles, as, you, as I mentioned when I'm talking about the results from accelerators. By the time everything else has died down, uh, all mm -hmm. you've got left among the stable particles are those that have that spin of half h bar making two revolutions. I have absolutely, uh, uh, I really have no concern. I'm not, I know particle physicists are concerned about it, but I really, I'm concerned about stable particles. I mean, the universe mm -hmm. has been around, but. 10 billion years at least, and something mm -hmm. that happened to pop up for uh, 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 15 or there about mm -hmm. seconds is not But, but again, I want to stop you before you go too far and, and say that it's not relevant because actually when you have an atom, when you have all, when you have all the spherical two, when you have the two spherical states consumed and you can't fit anymore, then only possible ones or the higher order ones I do mention different order ones in the um, <clears throat> when it gets to nuclear physics yes no, but in your in an atom like in a hydrogen atom and a helium atom you, then you can fit a spherical vessel a spherical completely polar uh, electric fields but when the, both those two possible polar fields are consumed and you need to squeeze in another field. They have to be the other uh, spherical Bessel functions. And that's why you see the, the other electron cloud formations. Right. I to, yeah, I, I, I've got to, uh, at this stage, say that um, <clears throat> I do later on deal with elementary particles, the, the uh, actual particles, um, uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, and neutrinos and then are able to use that to show how they bind together both the nucleons in the nucleus and <clears throat> the model has no difficulty <clears throat> explaining everything across the whole range from A equals 1 to A equals 250 or, or higher if you want to. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and uh, I just yeah, say I, it would be really interesting to, to have a high energy physics uh, experiments yeah. where you, you, you actually see that you don't you don't always get a completely spherical electric field you can trigger a state where you have a higher order spherical state even for a uh, I, I, have, I have 
But, have but no, I, have no, I have no doubt that can occur in particle high energy accelerators. But, yeah, my but it does occur in, in my, an, my, an yeah. atom. But Vivian, it does occur in an atom because <laughs> when the two lowest states are filled, there, there is no place for more than uh, higher order electrons. Well, why don't you why don't you let me go through the uh, presentations of the structure of the particles and then how the particles, the nucleons, combine to form uh, yeah. nuclei. Uh, when that's uh, done, I think we'd be in a better position to discuss yeah. that particular question. Yeah. Are, are you going to have a presentation on uh, the um, atom and the periodic system? Because that's what I'm looking forward also. You, you, you mentioned yeah. that in the book, right? <clears throat> yes, of course. So that's when I want to return to this question. <laughs> I think, I it think that, would be a better, that would be a better time. I mean, it's not possible to cover everything in one, uh, yeah. in one and, go. And there, that's where you need the spherical Bessel functions <coughs> where you actually see them, the effect of them, stable. Yes, yeah, so or well, mm. stability too. So, um, so that's what I would like to have clarify that this is the most stable free electron state. You don't see the higher order ones because they are not stable. But maybe you don't need to mention it in the presentation. But that's yeah. so. And then uh, you said uh, that in the circularly polarized photon illustration, it looks like the fields are bouncing, and that's not correct. The uh, it's it's rotating and you didn't manage to illustrate the rotation of the fields. No, one of the things uh, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, <clears throat> that photon, a, a discussion of photons is a very, very long one. Uh, and I'd almost say discussion on photons are a little bit like getting economists to have a committee meeting. Get three economists and you'll get five theories about what should happen. And I have yet to come across two photon experts who give the same explanation of a, of a, of a photon. And I think mm -hmm. this is so, uh, so rather than going into great detail at the beginning, Quisical's policy was, look, let us show what can happen, how all of how properties of photons can explain a huge number of things. Then we can get down when, when people know what uh, explanations can be given from this model and how it fits very well with the observations both at the uh, micro and subatomic particle level all the way through to the vastness of the universe then it's time mm -hmm. to discuss the properties of photons otherwise we can get bogged down <clears throat> for days if necessary as, as people would argue what is a photon if i yeah, may I, if i may mm -hmm. so i think this might be an issue of the actual diagram confusing the conversation because I think what Viv was going for in that diagram where it shows both green fields on the same side <laughs> is that even though he was drawing it to look like a linear photon, the point was just to illustrate that when it goes around in the circle, the field stays on the same side, not that the photon's fields are not corkscrew. Absolutely, but it's just during the time it takes a half uh, wavelength, it rotates also, but you don't show that in the illustration. Yes, I can say for, for that very reason that... Uh, um, <clears throat> discussions on photons, which can be presented later. I mean, John Williamson would be very happy to give a yeah, his version. Maybe, so maybe some someone needs to draw a, a more appropriate illustration. There, it it works. I mean, but it's kind of fake. It's better to have a, a thing that actually rotates. May, may, may I jump in there? Um, I should say that um, I love the way that Viv operates. He keeps things as simple as possible. And he's putting these things that he's getting the essence of what's required for these yeah, things. Yeah, the essence is there. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and and um, if, if you want to look at something where you're looking at those rotations, then have a look at some of, some of my models. But we should also say yeah. there are people here, Chari is one of them, my, myself another. Who yeah, you're spent... still one of the rotating photon uh, is, illustrations instead of the one where you have the um, um, rotating photon. Uh, uh, circularly polarized photo. Mm. But, but, but Joachim, you know that um, that we, we were involved with the uh, with, with with Chandra's um, uh, group on investigating. You know what is a photon, and you can get twenty talks times 
what do we get to? 13, 14 cycles on people discussing what the hell these things were. So Viv's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, it's, it's so, really uh, good that Viviani is string and with his, his way of presenting it. Yes. So it's clear. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah, so and I, I really like the how, how you <laughs> uh, how you explain uh, action at a distance and uh, this is just bogus. <laughs> <laughs> it's time someone says that. <laughs> well, it's and time how, someone said a whole lot of things. That you actually derive that it's just a matter of decoherence that you lose track of time. We either you have time coherence or time coherence, or you you lose track of time, and then it's random. And then I had one on page eleven. That's uh, illustration D three. You show a so tooth, and that's the same problem for me. It should be a sine wave there, <laughs> and the same on page twelve. A saw tooth. It should be a sine wave. That's so. Well, the sine wave viewed side on is actually a sawtooth. Oh, no. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> when it's me. All oh, right, OK. It's a simplification. It works, but it's not. I'm a scientist, not an artist. Yeah. Um, oh. And I would be quite happy to cooperate with anybody who can make those diagrams uh, uh, a little yeah, more realistic. Be, However, yeah, the that, that's concept is still the same. Yeah, the effect is the calculations are turn out the same, but it would be uh, more correct to have a sign there instead of a sort of just to, as a, a bit too far simplification for me. Uh, and uh, and then how you derive RV there from uh, from those uh, there should have been a sine wave then but uh, how you derive it from the just circular motion it's just beautiful and um, then I have the mind boggling question in the end and then I'm done <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, your in your way of representing it you have a slip motion forward of the uh, photon as it spirals forward in, in its direction of motion for me that means that space time has to compensate for that and that means like it has to be a tension or a torsion of space time and for me that feels like oh does that have to happen and for me it seems more appropriate to accept that when it does spiral, when it doesn't have to come to the same place, it is after two turns. It can can actually do less than two turns. Uh, I, uh, or maybe I, it doesn't I, need I, to, I, to do more I, than two uh, turns. Uh, but it has to uh, overlap, but it doesn't have to be fit perfectly. I'm not so sure about that. Um, <clears throat> Me neither. And okay, that's the one. Uh, you're, you're, I'm you're done. <laughs> Let me try and clarify a little bit what we've been saying there. That slip yeah. isn't a real slip. It's not moving in space. What he's doing is he's introducing the correction that's also happening, the relativistic correction that also needs to be taken into account. It's the same difference. Well, no, it's not that relativistic corrections are taken into account, John. And that is what generates the relative relativistic correct but the whole thing is, is is very what i've done is a very simplified presentation i mean there's absolutely nothing stopping from any anyone from uh <clears throat> doing the mathematical equation for that circle and then going around and solving it that can also be done and i uh, it, 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 for simplicity i also forgot to mention that at the same time as the photon uh <clears throat> is uh, spiraling uh, its mass is its mass is uh, increased its frequency is increased and that has to interfere uh, also that has to be mentioned also but by the time you go through and do all that and if you wanted to do the mathematics that's a couple of hours long and so i just had to uh, all i'm out to do is present the physical principles or outline the physical principles and no matter what else you do with that those, those physical principles of uh, <clears throat> the photon, not that it slips sideways, it has to actually be stretched as time, sli as its rotation slides down, its time 
uh, which means its time is slowing down, the direction it has to be stretched and it's stretched against the, um, it, it, <coughs> sorry, it's stretched against the, um, oh, I forgot. Yeah, so it's, it's stretched instead of slipping rather than against slipping. So it's stretch, the photon it stretches, but just showing that it's very vastly easier in my opinion just to say okay well those little green arrows represent the shortening of time shortening of space and yes time is slowed down they are interrelated and all i'm suggesting is that's the physical reason and it will be a and that sort of thing is a property of anything that makes a closed loop whether it's a square or whatever you want you will get the same answer and as i said the object of this was to show that there is a physical principle uh if one goes does the mathematics of what i've suggested you'll find that there is no other alternative but it's a it's time yeah, consuming this, to go it's time I'm consuming to go next. through everything sorry john carry on i'm, I'm going to this is equivalent to something else you're giving as well uh, there are two things going on one of them is Viv's absolutely right to say this is like a stretch so if you imagine for example a doppler effect in uh in sound, that's like a stretching of the wave if you're looking at it in, in terms of, or a shrinking of the wave, depending on whether you're moving towards it or not. And then on top of that, so it's like going from the Doppler effect to the relativistic Doppler effect. So you, you have a couple of factors going on there, which Viv has explained from one point of view. Now, tomorrow, I'm going to talk about them to get the same results from another perspective. But the physics of what's going on underneath it is the same in both cases. So, um, so, um, but um, but but it's right that you need to have, you need to look at more than one effect here, and that relativity is a consequence of what's happening here, not a, something that you put in. But I'll yeah, do that again. That, and that makes just that makes this theory so beautiful. <laughs> just that you can understand relativity, but it has to happen because you have light speed uh, photons. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It but um, I think it would be easier to follow if you said that the, the rotation slows down a little bit because it has to be in phase with the previous position and then it has to be there a little bit earlier. <laughs> there, there I agree with Joe. Right, and, and actually, Viv, may I ask a, 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 a question which follows on from that? Why, why do you insist on when the in the localized photon, the photon going round round? Why do you insist that it that it misses the position in its photon where the spiral doesn't complete? Sorry, John. There's there's, there's four microphones on, so I can't yeah, hear. What well, once again. Um, you know that diagram. I think it was in the slide six, yes, yes, where you have, yes. you have the thing going round twice, uh, yes. and then it doesn't quite join. What, what they, 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 they meet but not they meet but not join they can separate and the reason for if they if they uh -huh. meet and join you have a cylinder of uh, electromagnetic wave and that that wave can't move sideways ah you're saying you're saying that if they're moving they don't join but if it's stationary they join uh, they will meet but uh, they they will meet but not join no, because if they joined, then they couldn't move. I don't get so, that. Why that's necessary? Because you can, if you, if you have something which is just a rotating hoop, you can move it sideways. Why not? Well, if, <clears throat> like, like I said, if they met, met and joined, they, if they join and become a wave, they can't move in this direction. They can't move that way. They can. They can only move if they spiral. So in, in, if you think in 3D okay. and not uh, think in, the, in momentum space, then they have to stretch as a spiral and then you, they don't overlap, right? It's an infinitesimal small distance, but it, it's, it's there. It's a small distance. I, I, would say, I would say that what happens if you, if you have this thing stationary, it moves precisely. If you move it left, it starts to not move in one direction. If you move it right, it starts to not move in the other direction. But the point on which it doesn't quite join depends on its on your relative velocity with respect to it, also in momentum space. Yeah, and I will also say that the spiral that you illustrate, if uh, that spiral only happens when the, the when the particle moves at light speed, otherwise the spiral is so dense that it overlaps, and you never get light speed for a particle. 
No, you can't get light speed. You can get very close so to it. In effect, it's a cylinder. It's not a spiro. It's like a very dense spiral. So it overlaps very much, many turns, like before it loses correlation. To some extent, I think you'd have to turn around and try the mathematics of a um, of a cylinder or a uh, hoop and see if you could get the contraction. It's my impression is that, that if you got a hoop and moved it forward, that you couldn't get the could not get the contractions. Martin did general case of this at one stage, and actually, I think um, the map of that is in his uh, twenty nineteen paper, which is up on Quesicle. So I think Martin had a go at this, and uh, it took him a while because it's not easy, as you say. There's an easy direction to do this, and then it gets harder in the other direction. But you know, for Martin, that's just an interesting challenge. So I, I think it, it's on there on his uh, on, on on his twenty nineteen paper, the general case of. I think, it in. irrespective, um, we could agree to disagree on that. But irrespective, though, that the uh, the motion that that it is circular is going to give you the relativistic correction. So it's it's an, if if you make, make that basic <coughs> assumption that the motion is circular, then then it's enough to prove everything. But it, in John Williams's model, it says that it doesn't have to be completely circular, and it's still valid. It uh, has to be a circular, uh, it has to meet itself within two turns. That's the only thing it has to do. <laughs> yeah. If it goes round square as well, it's still works. But it doesn't, it doesn't go round, which is close to a circle. Yeah, I mean, going round in any, in any closed loop will give you those corrections. Yeah, Correct. any kind of loop that you meet yourself in two turns and you have that. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Is there a chance I can ask a question here? Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, and I'm I'm Wolfgang Beer, not uh, Andreas Beer, but uh, uh, I I have a, a more theoretical question. You mentioned the fields having, in a sense, first, and then the particles such as mass or charge, as a consequence. What makes you uh, uh, that? That's kind of a cause and effect uh, uh, statement that I don't see any necessary uh, reason for. Is there a, a reason for doing that, or why? I mean, it. it, it I think many people feel that there's a uh, that the source of fields uh, is in fact part of the, 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 the larger system. So why is there a cause and effect um, uh, in, in, in your system here uh, in one direction? Why, why wouldn't uh, mass or charges cause the fields that are doing the rotating in, rather than the other way around? Again, uh, I'm treating the photon as a particle. And it, it is the particle that is rotating to produce the mass. And then it is the mass that generates the electric and magnetic fields. Um, <clears throat> somewhere along the line, I guess, it's still the chicken and the egg situation of which, which one came first. As I said, treating a photon as a particle, which is basically what also what Einstein was doing, uh, and, and de Broglie, treating it as a uh, as a particle, then allows the photon to make those two revolutions. Even though the photon is a, an electric and a magnetic field, uh, it makes the two it makes those two revolutions, which generates the particles. Those particles then, in turn, generate the rest of the field. So I don't know how you express it. It's, it's a chicken and egg. Um, yeah, okay. Chicken and egg, that's a good uh, thing. You know, uh, as far as the rotating circle, I think there's another chicken and egg. I mean, one, once you assume there's a rotation that, beca that became from a helix, then what you're really doing is saying there's something rotating, some 
infinitesimal point rotating because uh, as John said, uh, a hoop, you know, in parallel can just move forward all at once. But if there is an actual individual thing rotating, then you can have the spiral. So there's something more inside this uh, rotating system that you're talking about than, uh, than I think has been mentioned. No, I think it's time for Jon, right? Well, I'm uh, more of the opinion that, uh, like I said, I'm just using that as a foundation and suggesting that that rotating photon model did it does indeed give a description of properties that are known that all particles have. The philosophy of what causes the uh, what is the photon and how to start out. Uh, is a whole new topic and that I think needs to if we got if we got involved in that right at the beginning I think people just wouldn't understand it so like I said I preferred to turn around and go through all of go through all of the ways in which this model matches uh, what is seen in the universe and then we can get back and discuss that particular property I yeah, think we can go be a, at that point, I think, because there are a whole series of possible models that one can put in here as to what's happening, which include, which, which, are, which are like the hierarchy of models, the Bohr model of the atom, Schrodinger quantum mechanics, relativistic quantum mechanics, and so forth. You're getting more and more precise about what you're talking about and perhaps more detailed. You're also going into a set of mathematics that nobody wants to look at and most people can't understand. So you're better off having something which is a good approximation of what's going on you then build a lot of more things on that are possible to think about than getting lost in maths, which can happen otherwise. So um, but we're going to do all of those things in different, uh, I think not, we're going to agree to differ in certain areas because I, I do think about these things as continuous loops, for example, where, 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 where Viv doesn't. And I do think about the thing being rotating in a different space where where Viv's more practical and thinks about it rotating uh, in, in, in actual space. So, but that doesn't matter because if you've got a model which then gives you the essence of what's happening for the next level, for building on top of this, which Viv is going to do in the next few talks, then it becomes possible to do things in that build that would be very difficult if one were to bring in, uh, were to bring in for example, spherical harmonics, Joachim. So uh, you, you, you wouldn't want to do that for the next level of things because it's introducing too much complexity too early on, as Viv says. So I, agree well, with I think, uh, uh, at least in Sweden, when you study um, um, high school level you, chemistry, you, you, are, you, get, you, you see um, a model uh, of um, electron and you hear mentions of spherical Bessel functions. Yes. So it's not completely um, you can use those words i think you, you and actually you it's very visual you, you can show it uh, as a cl point cloud or so yeah i agree i love i love yeah. pictures and um, i don't think in britain we quite do them in high school we do them right at the beginning of the university and uh, yeah no they are very beautiful but but i come back to saying that if you if you're looking at a, a model which gets the essence of what's happening and then build on top of that then it can be easier to take the next steps of putting that together in the building blocks that lead up to nucleons and so forth, and to nuclear physics, which we're just going to talk about in the next few talks that he puts up here in a more simple way than would be possible by going to something which is perhaps more complex mathematics at the moment. Yeah, and it's really good to take them step by step, slowly Absolutely. like this. Um, you, you have time to sink it in between the talks so it's really good i really like the progress you have on youtube now with the, you you have talks that glue together and intertangle together <laughs> everything talks about the same thing but different aspects of it it's really nice well, we have a, we have a wonderful group who are actually interested in the foundations of how stuff works so we're all passionate about this stuff i mean everybody here is passionate about the stuff as well so, um, so we're all passionate about trying to really just understand how stuff works. And I, I for one, am agnostic about the, the particular model. I don't think it matters 
which model you're using to think about something which is going to lead to a higher model, provided it's got the essence of that stuff in there. And I think you're better off using Newton's laws than uh, general relativity to calculate what happens in cars. And I think you're better off using Maxwell's equations for, for wavelengths better than quantum electrodynamics. Nobody uses quantum electrodynamics to calculate stuff in electronics. It's just too cumbersome and it's a useless brain tool. And you need to put the brain tools in place to go to the next level on that basis. Otherwise, it just gets too difficult to follow. Yeah, but then uh, when you do proper mathematics with uh, proper finite ele element analysis, you may you may have to make those assumptions sure. or Sorry. simplification. Uh, I think, I think more more Wolf, Wolf your, your microphone is muted. If you unmute it, then um, feel free. muted. No, I should be. I should be unmuted. It's, it's very important for okay. me to get down to what are the a priori assumptions here, and I think what you're saying, John, uh, is that something such as a circular electric field is not um, supported by any standard knowledge of uh, electromagnetic theory or anything. I mean, so this is an assumption that you that you're putting into you're assuming that such fields exist and once you make that assumption you can you can uh, explain a large number of uh, phenomena uh, that's very uh, cool. is yeah, that exactly. kind of what what you're saying because yeah, uh, uh, I, I would love to see some reason for why what is normally considered to be a uh, expanding electric field from a charge could be stable or even in any way exist i mean this is uh, this is not the first uh, 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 contrary to the first uh, equation of maxwell so uh, you know the divergence theorem there so so this is an assumption is that is uh, am i right in understanding what you're doing here well in the initial um approach yes it's an assumption so you say what if we take this as a starting point okay it doesn't it's not a solution to maxwell's equations it doesn't have any basis but what if we do take a photon then what are the consequences of that and then work out all the consequences and you find that a lot of things come into place that otherwise would be difficult to understand but that was throughout 1997 and we're now in 2020 so tomorrow we're going to talk about some of these things i'm going to talk about the emitter and the absorber the um the source and the observer and uh, and how both of them are essential to quantum transport and quantum collapse but then on the basis of a theory and that theory is indeed not maxwell's equations but is an extension of maxwell's equations my extension of that which is indeed no longer maxwell's equations but then it has a theoretical basis where mass is the thing and spin is the thing that's generating charge that's leading to charge that is the nature of charge if you want to see it in that way what you end up with is you end up with a relation though. You end up with a relation chicken and egg relation. Do you want to start with spin and derive charge? Or do you want to start with charge and derive spin? You, you can express one in terms of the other. And then you have a choice. And your choice is which of the two would you consider to be more fundamental? And for me, I, I would go for spin being more fundamental. And that one should show how charge arises from the spin, which is partly what Viv's been talking about as well at the moment. And um, that I think we did already in 1997, but I think we're on a more firm basis now that we have a theory which describes that as well, which is also an extension of relativistic quantum mechanics. So, um, but that theory is up there to be knocked down like any other theory by a single decent experiment, which shows that it doesn't work in some respect. So um, it's something which is cast out there on the water as a, as a theory, theory of the things one makes up their speculations to see if it, it certainly has a good deal of truth in it because it at least contains a good part of physics as it stands, um, relativistic quantum mechanics and Maxwell's uh, classical electromagnetism anyway, those two parts. So um, since it contains those two, it's um, already got a lot of um, experimental basis backing it up. But it does also have predictions, and those predictions could prove to be false, in which case one may be able to modify it or not, or may need to apply the scientific method and throw it away. But um, <laughs> But, but at the moment, I'm working on that theory uh, as well, which is much more mathematical than the stuff that Viv's been talking about. So I apologize in advance for that to everybody. But, um, but, but nonetheless, it's a, 
it's it's a complement, I think, to what Viv's doing here in some respects. It's look, it's trying to do to answer some of the questions that you're asking about which one comes first. And I think in both the case of, uh, of, uh, of whether the fundamental thing is the particles and the particles produce photons and you can't have photons without particles, or that the particles are themselves composed of a kind of localization of photons. And it's not just that because you need more. You need to say how they're localized and why they're localized and what's keeping the light going around in circles. And I think I did that in my first talk even on, on this series or at least I tried to try to address that problem in the first talk. But I'll try and make that more and more solid in the series of things that I'm going to add to this discussion. But it's not going to be a five minute answer, it's going to be a series of things which are clicking bits into place and moving the things forward. And, uh, God, uh, no, and I'm I very interested in this in this cyclic approach. Uh, if, if it, <coughs> when, you, you talk tomorrow is the same time? Uh, um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit earlier. It's the same time it's usually. I think it's nine o'clock uh, Pacific Coast time here. That uh, this one is at ten o'clock. So tomorrow is probably nine o'clock. That's the normal time I've seen. It was one hour earlier tomorrow than it was today. Yeah, got it. Okay. Very uh, much appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, John Williamson, I, I have a suggestion. When when you talk with John Bear about uh, circular um, electrons or circular fields, I think. If we could talk about quantum Hall effect, it might be easier to... You see, quantum Hall effect, you can have a, a model of the electron bouncing, or you can have a model of the uh, edge and the field along the edge. And they are you equivalent. Want to, you want me to take one of my old talks, you again? Yes, I think that would help uh, John Bear. And <coughs> then after that, uh, you can talk about fractional quantum Hall effect, and that would lead to, if you had a spherical uh, geometry, the Bessel functions, the spherical Bessel functions. Joachim, I intend to do that. I intend to get on to fractional quantum oh, Hall effect and connectivity. So, but that's really Perfect. sort of closer to the end of the whole thing. But I'm going to pull in quasi particles, but this is probably a couple of months' time, my friend. So, uh, and then it's really yeah. going to get interesting. Yeah, but I think uh, that less the kind of duality between particles and waves is very clear when you have an edge state in the magnetic field. It certainly is, and it's even more beautiful than you think because the relationship between the charge quantitation and a bit between the uh, flux quantitation and charge quantitation is also yeah. absolute. And the flux yeah, the flux quantitation is too clear there. Yeah. Yeah. That flux quantitation is much stronger than the charge quantitation. It's um hundreds of times stronger. It, 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 it's, it's, it's utterly, this, this is why you get things like giant Makita resistance and so forth. You have these extremely strong effects that nobody was expecting from the theory. It's coming about because nobody was expecting spin effects to be so incredibly important and such a much more overwhelming thing than the electromagnetic effects than the electric effects, sorry. So, but I'm gonna get onto that and I'm gonna yeah. get onto it. The other thing I want to talk about later is high temperature superconductivity and how to design metamaterials that will be room temperature superconductors. And that's in the same thing, that's in the same bit um, of, uh, of the talk. But this is in a few months time, I'm afraid. And uh, and that will be quite interestingly um, mathematical as well, I'm afraid in parts. I'm sorry, Viv. But, uh, <laughs> oh, we do understand some mathematics. One statement, uh, Wolfgang, you were saying about uh, with photons, you can't use I mean, Maxwell's equations don't cover all aspects of photons any more than you can get all you can get a glass of water and you get all the liquid all the properties of uh, bulk water and then you go down to an individual water molecule and expect it to have the same properties. Maxwell's equations are exceedingly good for uh, when you when you have a collection of photons beyond a, a certain number and everything averages out. But when you get down to the individual photon stage, although the uh, the overall equations still have some effect, they aren't everything any more than the overall liquid properties of water apply when you have a single water molecule. That's exactly things, right. Things change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I fully agree with that. Uh, uh, I, I'm just it, it's very important for me usually to try to identify uh, 
well, as John was talking about, the baseline from which the baseline of assumptions from which a particular theory evolves. Uh, and when I look at when I look at this theory, it seems as though there are some basic assumptions in how fields can be configured, how they configure themselves, that uh, uh, ought to be identified, or at least I think I'm identifying them in, in your work as those basic assumptions and and uh, i just need you know for me for my understanding i like i need that list if you will of uh, what it is that's underneath the theory because the just saying that a photon is a particle well uh you know as you've mentioned einstein said that as well but that was a linear particle and and uh, uh it, you know who knows if it's wrong there's the no, I'll stop there. You're absolutely right, and I will attempt to do that for a set of these things, and, and not just for you, because I think that's a very important thing to do. And um, maybe I'll also give you, I have a series of talks up on Vimeo if people want to look at them, where I've taken some of the major theories of physics, and what I've done there is I said these are the assumptions, these are the starting points, this is what goes into the theory, and this is what comes out of it. So I've done that. For ordinary quantum mechanics, relativistic quantum mechanics, quantum electrodynamics, a couple of other theories. And mm. really, you're absolutely right. We should really, each of us, when we're coming up and saying what's different about what we're talking about, we should be putting that list of assumptions up. I did this in my first talk. I said what I'm putting in is space, 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 time, and root energy, and then a mathematics which does products and division, and that's all. So, um, so, 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 one could do better here, and I think that um, we all ought to attempt to say where we're starting from. And you, you're completely right to say that the starting point here is assuming you can take a photon and make a particle from it. Like you go around round circles twice, and that's the particle. Now that is that is that is um, a postulate. That's a starting point for this, for, for what we're talking right. about. So, given that's the case, what are the consequences? So, of course, that isn't a given. It isn't given that. Um, that, that, that is the starting point. The starting point could be that electrons produce photons and they don't exist without charged particles. Well, John, That's a wide world view. It, in, it could in, terms be. Of, in terms of what's most fundamental, wouldn't the fact that we determine epsilon zero from C and mu zero, or we determine mu zero from C and epsilon zero, wouldn't that indicate that field is the fundamental thing? Not the part, not, not mass? No, there's, um, there's, um, yes, if, if that was all there was, Arnie, but it isn't, and there, there is a theorem. I, I would say mass is more, uh, more uh, <laughs> the root mass well, is even more fundamental. I agree um, with you. But, you know, I, I would like to have see John Mackin here. Uh, has he been invited? Is he but, even following? Joachim, I'll talk to you about that at some stage, okay? The other thing about all theories, I mean, even the uh, the standard model of matter has something like 61 separate particles, uh, 30 or however it is, quarks and gluons, uh, 42 of them have never been independently detected and isolated. Somewhere along the line, you have to have some assumptions to get started, and then you turn around from those assumptions and build the whole picture. And then from the whole picture, you get back to proof of the uh, proof of the assumptions. Uh, something has to be assumed somewhere along the line, and out of that, we will build the whole picture. That's the general idea. Remember, this is all part of the solution of Hilbert's sixth problem. Is it possible to find a set of axioms on which you can base the whole of science? So, so that will be a set of assumptions. It will be a set of starting points. They might be fairly basic ones that you can't really get away from, like the space and time themselves, because we can't sit outside space and time. And that may be the minimum that you can get down to, but it's a, a search that we're all involved in to find out what that minimum might be. But as Viv says, we're nowhere near the minimum at the moment with the standard model. There are dozens of parameters in the standard model which you take as starting points. And it's just not good enough. We have to do better. And we can do better, and we will do better. And we have done better, and we're going to do better still. So, um, so... so, so I 
Uh, well, my yeah, yeah, yes, I'm. I'm fully. Uh, uh, I'm very intrigued in this in this approach because I, I kind of believe in it uh, myself. So, but in my own world or head, I have looked at it and said to myself, I can't find a personal justification for containment of the electric field as is required here. So, uh, I accept that as an assumption and and move, let's move forward uh, don't, don't but, but so so i'm asking a question that's been in my heart for a while because i like the idea of the double rotation being fundamental and so on i have i have my own theories for that you're so right you're so right for 20 years that was the biggest question that martin and i had with the model that we had to assume that but this is 2020 have you seen the presentations and read the papers i have a mechanism for the confinement of the photon for my more, for my theory. So, so in, John has introduced uh, root energy as the confinement field. And what the root energy does to you is it introduces another component to the to the form momentum density. So what you get so, is you get e cross b as usual. You have e cross b, and that's moving obviously perpendicular to e and perpendicular to b. But when you introduce the mass term, it introduces a second term, which is mm -hmm. in the direction of root which is perpendicular. So your momentum is going forward, but it's also going round. And then that way you get round and round the circles. This is a super strong force, which gives rise to all of the other forces of, in a hierarchy of forces. And to a certain extent, um, last week, if you're looking at what, um, at what Peter Rowland said, he was talking about putting those things into a hierarchy of forces, which were also exchange forces, with one of them R characteristics, as well as deep characteristics, such as um, um, asymptotic freedom and infrared slavery and so forth as well, which is which are parts of the elements of the standard model, which perhaps are good parts of the elements of the standard model. So, but it's not not no longer the case that for me that the um, confinement is a mystery. It's no longer put in by hand. It's now calculated. And it uh, comes yeah, from yeah. But, but, okay, uh, let, let me let me call you or send you an email to get more specific because you have a you've written a lot and I'd like to uh, kind of zero in on that. It's extremely important for me because exactly what you're talking about is what I believe that by adding the yeah. the the uh, uh, gravitational concept you know into electromagnetic one can get such a confinement and if you've done that wow. Great, thank you. I, I, yeah, I, I it's really that. great. Yeah. Much, so everything much. works out so, so beautifully. But I think actually we don't even need to make the assumption about about the root energy field uh, ad hoc. It just come out comes out because you have space, time, and uh, 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 gravity uh, oscillations or space time oscillations. I think and those space oscillations gives rise to the effect of the root mass. Joachim, I think you're absolutely right. I think you can't not have the root mass. Because as soon as you, as soon as you define your starting points as space and time and allow yourself a product and a quotient, then, then it's just there. It's not added in as something. You're not just saying this. In the Dirac equation, you put the mass in as a lump. Look it up. Look at the Dirac equation. Here, it comes out as a product. If you multiply any two vectors which are parallel, or bivectors, multivectors, spin, pa spin parallel elements, for example, spin in the same direction, you end up with a mass term. You end up with a root mass term. So you're absolutely right, and thank you for pointing that out. It's not put in by hand. It's not put in ad hoc. It sits there in the structure of the, uh, of the, um, of the way that the theory works. And has to work. Uh, up and I, I think, John, you 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 <laughs> you make you you put it in by hand. You did, but it does uh, it, it does come out from uh, just having uh, space time, because you do have vibrations in space and space time, and then you get that effect. I, I think where it comes from, Joachim, is is not just space time. When you put space time in, but then you say there are products of space time. You say there's a, whatever a product is in reality. So if you multiply x by y, you get something different to x or y. And what you do then is you go up an index, you have a two index object, and that thing is a term which transforms, which is the electromagnetic field. It's the magnetic field, in fact. It's in the direction of the magnetic field. But if you put, if you multiply a vector in x by a vector in x, 
then in, in a tensor algebra you contract and you end up with something which has one index less and one index less than one is zero and that is a mass term it's not come in because you put it in it's coming it's not it's coming because you put multiplication in not because you put mass in so if you, if you yeah if you, but, but that's uh, just mathematics we, we talk, if you talk about physics the assumptions you have is that you have a three space uh, Three space directions and uh, time direction, and right. you have root mass. So you no. did in root mass. Oh, also. oh yeah, no, I see what you mean. You're right. No, but uh, but um, your Mackie, your Mackie says so you don't even need to do go. that. No, no just a minute, just a minute. Um, but that's but it's not quite correct what you say. I mean, you're right to a certain extent, but it's not quite the whole story. What I'm saying is that you're put, I'm not putting in root mass. I'm putting in root energy, and that root energy can appear as mass or as current, or as field, or it can play with anything else as well. The root mass is a magnitude, it's a different kind of thing, it's a 17th component. So, so, so yeah, but, but still, what I want to say is that you, you don't even need to say that you have to assume that, you can actually derive it from just the vibration of, of space-time. Your point is those, well taken. It leads to an appropriate that behaves like a, a root energy. That's right. I mean, you're right. I have to put root energy in the sense that, um, that I'm adding root energy. Yeah, and and John Mackin derives that root energy vibrations. <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, when you talk about a particle that sweeps up and, and take, absorbs root mass energy, I think yes. about uh, John Mackin's vibrations getting soaked up. No, John Mackin's vibrations are... Um, are making an assumption that there's a quantum vacuum there, which is very, yeah. very massive. And this is a very, yeah. very bad thing to do. Uh, it's not observed. It would have enormous consequences. It would crush you. It would destroy you. <laughs> if you work out the fluctuation... Listen, this is in, important. No, no, in, no, our no. Word, uh, in our word, we, we can be just quasi-particles on, on top of a very rigid yeah. other word that we don't see. Were, yeah, but if you were a quasi particle, this is a this is a, an over ten to hundred difference. In talk to Viv about this. Don't get Viv started. But okay, <laughs> but if you've got something which is at the order of ten to the hundred, the fluctuations are roughly half the square root of that, ten to the fifty. If you've got ten to the fifty fluctuations on something, you're going to be statistically blown to bits by the uh, by gravity and motion. Forget about it. It's wrong. It's experimentally absolutely wrong. And uh, and but starting John Booth, you and I have, have seen that the only properly ideal po matter that you can do real uh, proper ideal experiments with are the really hard solid materials. Because yes. then that's when you have ideal quasi-particles. You're right. And, and, and as you know, I mean, quasi-particles have been quite a large part of my uh, physics career. And... Um, don't worry though, you can get the quasi-particles, the electron that I'm talking about is a quasi-particle anyway, without all of that quantum field theoretic uh, fluctuation. I think I I'm going to do a little presentation on that to say why it is complete bullshit at some stage, and in the not too far distant future, because I think it's wasting a lot of lives. So, um, so I'm going to have... Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't block the progress, so we can still continue with the progress from, from what you have. It's just another way of seeing where you can build your, your foundation. I think the thing that, that um, I think is absolutely vital with any theory you make up is that you must take all of the consequences of that theory, not just take an abstraction from one of them. And I think that there's too much of this in science, that people have theories which, okay, might predict the particles you actually see in terms of the standard model, but they also predict a whole slew of particles that you do not see. And a theory is equally false if it's predicting things you don't see as if it's not predicting things that you do see. And a big example of that in the standard model is glue balls. They should be there and they are not. And I can tell you that from personal experience because I've got a lot of papers that start with a search for glue balls in. And glue balls are balls. Forget about it. They're not there. And the fact they're not there means that whole theoretical stuff is, should be, by the scientific method, discarded. But it doesn't get discarded because people don't know how to do it better. So I think we're in a situation where, like the cartoon character that's run off the cliff that's about to fall down, it's getting very ridiculous for a lot of people. Everybody knows it's going to fall. Even the people doing it know they're going to fall. 
but everybody's still running. And it has to stop because it's a waste of lives. So, um, sorry, I'm getting a bit strong on this, aren't I? I don't, uh, yeah, I, I shall calm down. I, I, well said. Calm down. Well said. Right. That was beautiful. We, yeah. But, but Joachim, I'm with you 100%. These things are quasi-particles, and I'm going to show you how. I'm going to do the quantum Hall effect and the fractional quantum Hall effect for you. Don't worry, it's all going to be good. They are quasi-particles. The stuff we're looking at now is, I mean, look at what Garnet was saying as well. I mean, you're, you're talking about things which, from an abstraction level, which is, which, is, which, is, um, which is just what happens between tick and top, you're already able to derive Dirac, you know? So, uh, so, so, so the level of stuff that comes in here from, from, from abstraction, where you make it simpler, is tremendous. Uh, thank you, John, for giving a nice segue to what I'm going to talk in July. Uh, this is Charlie here. I'm just saying that thank you, John, for giving a nice segue to what I want to talk in July, how people are wasting lives and money by saying that they're discovering the mysteries of nature at the very fundamental level. That's quasi-particles. Thank you. John, John, you're Sorry, muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, brilliant. I think, uh, lovely. I'm looking forward very much to your talk as well. And uh, I, I, it was a real pleasure to meet you the first time I met you. And every discussion I've had with you has been very fruitful. Uh, but I think we've only had about two. <laughs> so, so bringing more in is going to, uh, I'm looking forward to it very much. So, um, yes, good. My, I'm great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Gentlemen. I think, did Garnet, do you have a question? Well, I, I was just going to say that, 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 that um, at least my perspective, pretty well all of this stuff actually comes in through special relativity. And, uh, and uh, um, you know, even Viv's talks today, really, it all happens because uh, of the, in a sense, the collision of, of the speed of light being constant in the universe, and uh, and you know, it, regardless of, of the reference frame that you're you're, you're in, and uh, in terms of the, the you know a mass ar arriving, in a sense, all you have to do is, is a, a, a back away from this sort of the, the, the second and a half postulate in special relativity, which thinks about a continuous world line uh, and, and back out and say, OK, well, let's let's just consider a sequence of points. As soon as you go discrete, um, in many ways, the Dirac equation just falls out from the discreteness right? because of the because of the, 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 uh, the, the Compton wavelength. And as soon as that happens, uh, uh, the discreteness throws in the, the, the Fourier uncertainty principle, right? It's, that, it's, a, it's a feature you can't avoid because you've made, in a sense, you've made uh, uh, in a physical reality something that you can't get around in, in, in the mathematical uh, uh, world. As, as, soon as, you, as soon as you're saying you're associating a signal with a particle and you've got the equivalence of inertial frames, then that's spread over... <laughs> The whole forward light cone from from whatever the the, the, the source is, and it's, it becomes a feature of space time. That you simply can't get around. Right? I mean, it's 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 just there because it's a mathematical fact that the you know you, you you've got different representations have to say the same thing. Yeah, so but it's not just a mathematical fact; it's also physical because if you're looking at anything that's a clock and it's going around in circles, it has to come backwards and forwards. So it has to have a digital dimension, and then you're stuck with that. I'll stuck with yeah. it. It's what happens. So, uh, fantastic. fantastic. It is fantastic. And, and, and as you say, when you look at it in, from the point of view of geometric algebra, you, you, know, you, you see why you know, both the Dirac al algebra occurred in special relativity and it uh, occurred in quantum mechanics. And, and there's this, you know, you, you sort of scratch your head at first and say, well, why do, why do these two things that are so related uh, happen in these completely different contexts well you find out in the end that, 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 that there's a continuum limit in there that's been thrown in at different points different points and if you if you put it in at one point you get the Dirac equation and you get, if you put it in the other uh, point you get back to special relativity which doesn't associate a signal with the particle 
and and so you're back into a continuous world uh, 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 that's classical. You're right, so, right but, it, but if you look at the whole thing, which determines the equation of motion, as as Peter was saying, you can move the bits around. So if you move the bit from one outside a bracket to inside a bracket, the way that you look at things also changes. But it's of course the same thing. It's just a different perspective on the same absolutely. thing on yeah, the yeah. continuous screen. So isn't it gorgeous? It is. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just fantastic. <laughs> I mean, all together. So, uh, so, but you see, yeah. this is this is such an adventure, gentlemen. I mean, this yeah, is, it really is. It's everything glues together so beautifully. Every, all talks together, uh, all fit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't had this much fun for a year or two for one or two reasons. So I'm very grateful to all of you for contributing and. Uh, and making this a great pleasure for me to be involved with you all. So uh, thank you all uh, for this as well. So, uh, so, and uh, I think we're just going to have more and more fun. So, uh, and I think a lot of good things are going to come out of it. So uh, I think a lot of good things already have come out of it. So, um, so let's keep it up. Um, I, I, I may move to doing more than two a week. We may want to get more than this. Um, so perhaps I should put an email around saying, Lou, for one, Lou, Lou Kaufman said that he wouldn't really be able to make more than about one a week because he's so busy. And um, so, so maybe we want to stick to two for a little while and see how we go on. But I'll be soliciting you know, unsolicited emails as to, no, let's do, let's have a conference. Let's do five, five a day. <laughs> yeah, well, OK. <laughs> John, as long as we can all see uh, uh, the talks uh, on YouTube, uh, I'm fine with the high tempo. But really, we have had 20 years. Uh, we don't need to rush. No, that's true. Yeah, you will get the Nobel Prize, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. Hey, yeah, well, not the main aim. The main aim is just to understand how much things work, how things work. 